We have Rajiv Vijay Sinha, who was uh, in fact the former state minister of higher education, Sri Lanka. Uh, thanks so much, sir, for speaking to us and taking uh, uh, your time out to speak to us on Republic. Starting with the top focus, SR, which is the economic crisis in Sri Lanka. What do you think are the factors that have driven Sri Lanka to this stage where it is facing a complete meltdown of economic uh, uh, issues faced in the country? Well, there are two factors which have been endemic in Sri Lanka for the last uh, decade or so, which is A, overwhelming incompetence, and two, uh, enormous corruption, which is engaged in by uh, you know, most politicians. There are hardly any who have what is called a clean reputation. This is very true of this government. It was true uh, to a lesser extent, but still flagrantly of the last government, where the leadership also was in involved in, uh, you know, appalling measures that drove up the interest rates government had to pay on any brains. And uh, it's also partly due to our ludicrous electoral system, which wouldn't permit for any expertise to emerge. So to look, for instance, at the president or indeed the last one. There's hardly anyone of either actual competence or commitment to the public good. And, uh, you know, where people thought Kabirasa to introduce some discipline into the whole process, uh, he hasn't done anything of the sort. He has actually turned into an a lowest common denominator, which is incredibly bad, it destroyed a reputation for uh, energy and discipline that uh, he held before. Hmm. Well, um, sir, if you can hear me, another important aspect of this is the role of India at this stage, because India has been doing quite a lot when it comes to aiding Sri, Sri Lanka and battle, as it battles economic crisis. In fact, India has agreed to help Sri Lanka overcome the financial crisis by pledging $2.4 billion in Jan this year. So uh, a lot is already, is already being done by India. Any more uh, uh, issues you think India can help Sri Lanka with as it battles economic crisis and uh, the financial aspect, particularly when it comes to uh, the aid by India? I mean, I think we have to be very grateful to India for chipping in, <clears throat> not least because, <clears throat> you know, the present government, <clears throat> especially in its post-2012 incarnation, I'm talking to the Rajapaksas, let India down very badly on a number of commitments, uh, which in fact made the situation worse. And that contributed to the news that India was, uh, you know, part of the overthrow of the government, Rajpaksa government way back in 2015. But then, unfortunately, India, India does have this tendency that it tends to be very indulgent to incompetence and corruption. And both the 2000 government and what's happened now has not had any measures. You know, one of the problems with borrowing money to pay off debts mm. is that the only justification for borrowing is to actually create greater wealth. Mm. And uh, we see no signs of that at all. And I think perhaps a bit more, uh, let's say, good advice from India, mm. coupled with certain conditions mm. about actually economic uh, responsibility, would do. Right. I still remember when I was in the parliamentary delegation to India, back in 2012, uh, the Indian then Minister of Parliamentary Affairs, a very nice man, was trying to tell our government about how to have a committee system to increase accountability. And no one else understood. You know, I told our uh, speaker there, who was wonderfully amiable and danced admirably with your speaker, to actually take advantage of the visit and try to introduce some of the reforms that very tactfully your parliamentary mm. minister, affairs minister had suggested to us. But there's no awareness of the structural changes this country needs. And I'm afraid the intellectual capacity to understand is completely gone from this government. You know, before the last election, there was perhaps one minister who was uh, you know, intellectually admirable. He's gone now. And you now have a situation where if this unrest increases, 
you know, I, I suggested a couple of weeks that Gotabe should be thinking of an exit strategy. But the exit strategy involves having a government that people can trust. And I don't think there's anyone in the present government, right. maybe two exceptions. And sir, uh, another significant aspect of this would be, you know, how Sri Lanka has been relying heavily on China to fund it, uh, the country financially. But we are seeing with Sri Lanka not being financially sound to be able to repay those debts. So India, on one hand, has been financially aiding Sri Lanka and, you know, uh, helping it in the battle, the, the tough times. But there we have China not really coming forward to uh, probably restructure the debt uh, as well. So is there more you think China could have probably done and it can do to battle uh, for Sri Lanka to battle out the financial crisis the country is facing? Well, let's start your question because I will lose internet connect. But in terms of, I think one of the tragedies at Sri Lanka has been uh, several governments thinking they can play one off against the other, thinking that, uh, you know, they can, if they don't like one country, rush to the other. And it's really been very messy. I mean, I still think it's extremely important to remember that at our time of great crisis, when both India and China rallied around to help us when the West was persecuting us about our trying to get rid of terrorism in Sri Lanka, uh, China told us, please make sure that you remain on India's right side. And I don't think that was uh, anything but extremely good advice. And similarly, India has never really wanted exclusivity. That is a, a talent of the West to demand that if you support us, you must uh, then uh, support us against people we, we see as our enemies, even if they're uh, you know, quite friendly to you. And this happened in the 2015 government, which was so very bitterly anti-China, that China, who had been very helpful to the Rajpaksa government, uh, you know, turned quite horrid and took full advantage of the helplessness of that 2015 government to uh, demand uh, a 99-year lease on the Haman report, or rather they did They gave an alternative and the enormous corrupt elements in the government handed it over 99 years. And although there's this myth that the Rajapaksas were selling the country to the Chinese, they were actually more moderate in their approach. The government is the one that gave a 99-year lease, which was absolutely appalling. And it began the, you know, slide downwards in which we seem to be just parting with profit in order to keep people happy. Absolutely. But, uh, so, yes. I get your point there and you know I can understand the helplessness there as a country tries to battle out its worst crisis that it's facing in decades and uh, we'll have to leave it on that note but let's just hope that Sri Lanka battles it out and India of course coming forward to help uh, Sri Lanka in all possible ways and China also does something as uh, Sri Lanka fights it out. Thanks so much for joining us.